Hi, this is Dr. Nicholas Rose from Mount Sinai. I'm here with Dr. Isabel Preshigal from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Dr. Joshua Sabari from NYU Langone Health and our special guest, Dr. Rahul Gosain from the University of Rochester Medical Center. Welcome to Lung Cancer Conversations. We're here to discuss best practices for ensuring appropriate treatment of early stage lung cancer in the community setting. Early stage lung cancers become very complex, right, with newly approved adjuvant therapies as well as neoadjuvant therapies. Dr. Gassain, you mentioned that you see about 10 to 15% of patients who have lung cancer. What percent of those patients have early stage, stage one to 3A disease? About 40, 45% are early where the treatment is with curative intent. Dr. Gosain, do you feel like a lot of the lung cancer patients that are hitting your door are aware of lung cancer screening and getting this done? Historic data shows that not just in the community, across the nation, we have not done so well when it comes to screening for lung cancer, like what we do for breast cancer or even colon cancer. We are seeing a little more that these patients are picked up early because of the lung screening. In my opinion, we need to educate our primary care physicians because in my experience, these patients are followed with them. One of the parts of diagnostic workup is biomarker testing in the metastatic setting, but something that's evolving in the early stage lung cancer setting is also biomarker testing. Dr. Gosain, do you see that happening in the community? Anytime we're talking about biomarker testing, anyone you talk to, we would like to believe that everyone is doing it in the right settings, but the data does not support that. So I really think that we all need to continue to educate the providers to talk about this. And like you said, it's not only in metastatic settings that it's important, now all this is moving forward in early stages. In the early stage setting where it is so complex, what are you following? What are your guidelines? How do you make decisions for your patients in your clinical practice? As this field's evolving, I really personally tend to use NCCN guidelines, ASCO guidelines, con conversations at the multidisciplinary board or tumor board are so critical so that we can get the feedback from other medical oncologists, our uh, surgeons and radiation oncologists to make sure we're all doing the best for the patient. In early stage non-small cell lung cancer, it's important for oncologists to follow guidelines as there are approved neoadjuvant and adjuvant treatments available. While it's difficult to keep up with the current treatment landscape, discussing approved options with your multidisciplinary colleagues should help make sense of the best approaches to use with your individual patients. NCCN guidelines recommend testing eligible patients with resectable stages 1B to 3A and 3B non-small cell lung cancer for EGFR mutations, ALK rearrangements, and PDL1 to help determine the appropriate treatment options. Dr. Gassain, are you discussing these early stage patients with your colleagues and is it at tumor board, is it informal? Tell us what it happens in your own clinical practice. In my current practice, these patients are presented at the tumor board. Dr. Gossain, what do you think are some of the barriers to community practitioners to obtaining this biomarker testing and intercalating it into their practice? I think there are quite a few factors to this. One being limited tissue availability, so that is something we can run into. But in rural settings, this could be because we don't have an interventional pulmonologist or a robust IR team. So tissue ends up being the issue. Yeah, at our academic institutions, a lot of times we come to a consensus opinion with the group and we treat most patients in that same paradigm. Are there these consensus paradigms in your practice? Yeah, so this is something that we're working very hard on to make sure it's not just the mothership that has this consensus paradigm or a team agreeing on everything, but also making sure we're disseminating those consensus or best practices throughout our regional practices and our partners. But again, I think being in that situation, I'm better off because I have someone that I can rely on. In rural settings, when you are it, when you are a solo practitioner, you don't have that liberty. That is where it gets critical to make sure that you are partnering up with these quaternary centers. So either you can present these cases at their tumor board virtually, or at least get some feedback on what they would do in their centers. Gone are the old days of this patient goes straight to surgery, and then we can figure out everything on the back end later and hope that things are, are well. We had to get these patients to their original diagnosis or their concern for lung cancer on a scan, to a biopsy, 
to complete staging, to therapy, and there's a lot of roadblocks along the way. At my institution, I feel very fortunate to have many resources at my fingertips. However, you know, nothing is ever perfect and time is of the essence and treatment never starts fast enough for these patients. It's a ticking clock. The second they have their diagnosis, they wanted treatment yesterday, right? But you're like, oh, we need these staging scans. We have this. Oh, we also have this neoadjuvant protocol. Do you want to hear a little bit about it? But unfortunately, it's going to take two weeks because we have to do X, Y, and Z before you can get on protocol. So patient-centered treatment, I think, is the most important thing. Dr. Go saying in the community, what do you think are the biggest roadblocks and barriers to getting an early stage lung cancer patient to their treatments? Yeah, I think that the challenges that we see in the community are similar to what you've mentioned, but then we have our own inherent challenges because the patient population that we see is different. There's a uh, social economic status that's different. I'm doing this for lung cancer. I'm doing this for breast cancer. I'm doing this for colon cancer. So this is very tasking. So I think that the challenges that we see at the community level can be a little different than what we see at your center. You bring up a great point. I think having a quarterback guiding care is critical. You know, at our center, we have nurse navigators who help, you know, sort of facilitate the scans, the biomarker testing. I'm curious if it's something you're utilizing in your practices as well. And how has it helped uh, in your management of these patients? Even in an academic center, I am very possessive of my patient's care and I like to be that quarterback. So I like to be the one who's talking to radiation oncology or surgery, my pathologist, my radiologist to make sure that all that workup is getting together. So often at the first touch point that I have with that patient, I make sure I know who their team is. I create an email chain or a, a, you know an EMR chain of conversation so we can all be on the same page and get that communication going. So Dr. Gassan, you mentioned in, in the community practice, you may not have access to these resources and your patients are at you know, uh, you know, a, a sort of, you know, maybe a socioeconomic disadvantage or a health literacy disadvantage. You know, who sort of then quarterbacks for them? Is it, is it you? Yeah, I think that when we were talking about all these moving parts, we all have to realize that it is teamwork. And like you said, a lot of that onus comes on the physician to make sure that they're the ones reaching out and coordinating that care. Yeah, jumping back specifically into biomarkers, because we know that it has become so critical in guiding therapy in the early stage setting, who owns that testing? I know even in academia, that's something that can oftentimes get lost in the shuffle. Who's ordering it in your clinical practice? Who's making sure that it's resulted and in, in integrated into the patient's chart? Often it is the medical oncologist who would send these tests out. Dr. Gosain, how do you manage the side effects of therapy for early stage lung cancer patients? Yeah, I think uh, that is such a critical question because it's not just keeping up with the approvals, but how to manage and how comfortable we are with these drugs. In my opinion, educating our patients, our nurses, keeping up to date with how to manage these toxicities on our end is very critical. So you have to just keep up with the literature, use the drug, get comfortable with it, and reach out when you have any questions. I think, you know, definitely knowing the basics, what to expect, and setting the stage for your patient, right? Dr. Gosain is so important. I basically say, if you feel any different than you feel at this very moment in the room with me, you got to call me. Right away, 3 a.m., it doesn't matter, anytime. And, and that's, that's the take home message. But I do think there are times where we need to rely on our symptom care team and our palliative care team to help us with these, with these side effects and help us with, you know, making sure that these patients are as tucked in as possible. That is another thing that I speculate lacks in the community or rural settings is getting palliative care involved from the get go. It is so important for our patients and our community providers. I think we oftentimes think about that in the metastatic setting, the stage four setting, but you make a great point in patients who are curative and intent, stage one to three A, it is critical to get supportive care oncology. So I wanna thank Dr. Gosain and, and the group. This is a great discussion. Really, this is a complicated space, uh, the early stage setting. Uh, we really need to follow guidelines and, and discuss these with our, you know, uh, um, our uh, oncology colleagues in this space to have the best possible treatments for our patients. Mm -hmm.